panel and panel of Dragon Cant. I am the Clockwork Doctor, and today our topic will be. I advertised the title as Our Friend Newton, How Physics Should Be Used in Sci-Fi, and I made a horrible mistake in the title. I shouldn't have used the word should. Who am I to tell other people what they can and cannot write about? It should be how real physics can be used in sci-fi. Um, thank you, Mark. Yes. Um, I am not here in this panel to tell anyone what they can and cannot write about or how they should uh, craft their stories. You're the writer. You decide that. Uh, we're merely going to have a discussion on real physics, Newtonian physics, a uh, reminder of the rules, and we'll get, uh, we'll get going from there. I will ask everyone uh, to please mute your mics while I go through my opening rant. And eventually, uh, I will uh, come to a question and answer period. Uh, I'll ask questions. You can ask me questions. We'll just prattle around. Uh, at that point there, uh, unmute your mics, please. So... I'll just uh, dive right in then. So, to break the rules, you, ha you must know the rules. We all understand that sci-fi universes are individually special. It could be anything. It could be a combination of things. From changes in history to different biological evolutions to midi calorians, it doesn't matter. Sci-fi universes break all the rules. But in storytelling, like all art forms, you have to understand the rules of your universe before you break them. Now, why would we care? Because a solid foundation helps build better stories. Color theory and brush stroke help make a better painting. Formal lessons make a better dancer. There will always be exceptions to each rule, the self-taught savant, the genius. But for the rest of us, we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to work our way up. A little about myself. I am the clockwork doctor. I have no formal physics training outside of high school. I'm just an avid fan. Uh, I am a giant geek. I work with guns and engineering and machines all day long, and I happen to think about them pretty much all the time. Uh, thinking about things in an engineering sense and in a mechanical sense, uh, I find helps me in my day-to-day -day life, and I have these things running through my head, so I tend to watch movies much to the dismay of everyone around me as I happen to find mistakes, you know, guns six shotguns that fire eight times without the editor noticing. This, this, this annoys and saddens me. But hey. So, now to my disclaimer. No one cares if you break the rules. That's the point of writing fiction. We get to write our own stories. That's the joy. But remember that science is in the name science fiction. I find that if you cling to one nugget of truth and you expand from there, you can, you can craft a really good, very believable story. Babylon 5 has warp gates, space aliens, and really, really, really bad costume designs. But they cling to a physically real universe where spaceships have to spin to create their gravity, or uh, they need thrusters to alter their momentum as they, as, they, as they fly through space. Star Wars. It was a, a runaway success. They broke every single rule of physics, and no one cares. Do we care that an X-Wing can fly like a regular plane through space? No, because it's not important. So we carry on. Give you an example of how and when to break the rules and what I'm kind of, the point I'm kind of getting at here. Let's, let's think about the X-Men. The X-Men have superpowers. They're better than... They, they, they have characteristics that bring them above and beyond normal people. Do we care when Colossus picks up a car and throws it? No, he's an X-Man. He's super. Of course he can pick up a car. Now, if normal people in the universe started picking up cars and throwing them, then it would take away from the superness, and it would sort of put a hole in the universe, and we wouldn't really understand what was going on. So your, your supers stay super, your mundane stay mundane, in whatever way you've decided for your universe. Yes, no, you're right about the White Stars uh, having their own gravity wells, and they flew in a, in a different sense, but that's because of the, the alien technology, and they made that understood, that the human technology hadn't reached that level yet, which, you know, they established in the universe, and they went along with it, and it, 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 was, quite, it was done quite well. So let's re reacquaint ourselves with uh, our good friend Newton. Our good buddy Newton wrote three very important laws. 
And these laws govern absolutely everything that, that goes on in our real universe. So, law number one. Objects in motion remain in motion until acted upon by an outside force, and the same is true in the inverse. Objects at rest remain at rest until acted upon in an outside force. Except for spinning dragons. They, they follow whatever rules they want. I mean, he's a dragon. I'm, I, Newton got nothing on dragons. So, an example here is what happens in space. If an object is moving in space with no outside forces acting upon it, it'll just keep going, and it'll keep going forever until some outside force acts upon it to, to move it in another direction. Everything from physical collisions to solar winds to any form of a force hitting that object will, will, will move it slightly or dramatically. So, things like Star Wars. Star Wars got that rule wrong. And we all understand that uh, the, 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 the fighters in the space flight scenes should not have been able to turn in the way that they did. They would move more like uh, they do in Babylon 5 or if you ever watch any of the NASA videos of things you having to use thrusters to adjust their direction and their momentum as they fly. It's a much more believable method of movement than there was in Star Wars. But yet again, no one cares because Star Wars had a really, really cool story and you just sort of were able to gloss past all of that. Star Wars was World War II space pulp, really. They really sort of took the science out of it. it. It could have been set in almost any world with the same story because the story was so powerful and so character driven that it could have been in medieval times, a country, western, anything, and the same story would have would have worked, I feel. Law number two, objects acted upon by a force will move in the direction of the applied force and in proportion to that force. This is where we get our first equation, FMA, so force equals mass times acceleration. An example of this and something to, to really think about is a fly versus a train. A, f a fly is moving along one way and a train is coming the other and they hit each other. What happens? Does the train stop? Does the fly stop? Objects influenced by the force will continue until the story needs them to stop. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Mark. So, <laughs> what happens here is the fly and the train hit. What happens? Well, they each exert a force upon each other, but the fly has so little force compared to the train that the train's just going to keep going. The fly's going to stop, and the fly's going to compact into the train, turn itself into a piece of mush, and the train will keep going. Now, did the train feel any force? Of course it did. But it was so minor in comparison to the massive force that the fly felt that it just kept going. Now, if it was two trains at the same speed hitting each other, they would both stop. You would have a catastrophic failure. Both trains stop. If it was one train moving at half the speed of the other, one would get pushed backwards. So... You see this in sci-fi movies all the time where the guy stops the train or uh, the, the guy drops his shoulder in and he stops the car and the car just stops dead and he stops instantly. Forces and mass and acceleration in most universes, cars weigh a lot more than people. So even if the guy had the physical abilities to stop that car, it would push him back some. And I have seen some where the guy stops the train and he gets dragged backwards a couple of hundred yards with his heels making huge tracks into the, into the earth. A lot more believable than somebody just stopping the truck dead. Now, maybe his superpower is a redirection of kinetic energy. Maybe he uh, can alter his mass to be much more massive. Maybe we just don't care. Whichever. Hey, you get to play with the rules. You're the one right in the universe. I'm just saying. Newton wrote it. The third of Newton's laws, the big one. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Something I read in a, in a book a long time ago, and I've always held true to this. So let's say we had a character with infinite strength. The guy is super strong. He can pick up anything. Let's say he picked up an ocean liner. What would happen? Something, an object like an ocean liner, is meant to disperse all of its weight and mass and energies 
through the water over a large area. If you were strong enough to pick up an ocean liner and you tried, all of the weight and mass of that object would be transmitted through two tiny spots, your hands. Can the weight of an ocean liner be suspended on something as small as a human hand? No. So, two things would happen. One of two things would happen. One, you would either punch a human-shaped hole through the bottom of the ocean liner, and it would fall onto the ground, or it would drive you into the ground like a tent peg. Anyone who's tried to pick up wet bread slices should know this. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Think of a balloon. If you hold a balloon in your hand, the weight, however small it is, of the balloon is dispersed over all of the contact points and surfaces of your hand. Now try to hold the balloon with a pin. What would happen? The balloon pops instantly because it's trying to disperse all of that weight and area on something as tiny, tiny as a pin. Another example is, yeah, a bed of nails, exactly. You try to sit on one nail, what happens? The nail drives right through you. You sit on a bed of nails and your weight gets distributed over the various contact points and you can actually do so quite comfortably. We did that at Science East. Yes, we have done that at Science Centers and it is a, it is a lot of fun and it is a great experiment. So, all actions have equal and opposite reactions, which is why bullets hitting people, as, as, as much force as a bullet carries, will not throw an average, you know, an average size bullet, will not throw somebody back 10, 20 feet. The mass of the person is so much more than the mass of the bullet, even though it hits with tremendous energy, does not have enough energy to knock someone back. More on ballistics at a, at, a, at a later date when I start writing more about that. You guys will all see that on the blog. This is not about ballistics. This is about my good buddy Newton. What happens if the energy is dispersed, say, by a flak jacket? Hmm. hmm. Having watched videos of guys hit by flak jackets, they don't fly back uh, any farther. You're still being hit by the same amount of energy. It's just being dispersed radially instead of being punched directly through you but the amount of energy that you're being hit with is is still the same uh, there was a video a very famous video by a um, a company called second chance they make bulletproof vests they have maybe the coolest name in the industry I'm pretty sure it can be found on YouTube they have a guy standing on one leg wearing a bulletproof vest with a trauma plate and he takes a shot at point-blank range from a high-powered rifle and he doesn't fall over the kinetic energy that hits him is the same. It just happens to be dispersed before the bullet goes punching through his chest. Uh, there's a, a famous video of a, um, taken by an Iraqi sniper as he shoots an American soldier, and he hits him square in the plate, right in the chest. And the soldier gets hit. He trips. He falls down. He gets back up. He looks around, and he runs into his Jeep. And then there's a photo afterwards of him holding up his... Uh, holding up his, uh, his shirt and showing this like massive purple bruise from where he took the impact. But he lived. He wasn't very happy for a couple of days, but he lived. Okay. Use bigger guns with flat pen bullets to send people flying. Yes, exactly. Now, if you were hit by a cannon shell, oh, you're flying. Because that hits with so much more energy and is so much faster. I'm picturing Wile E. Coyote. Yes, Throwing Lead by J.D. Sawyer. A great book with uh, great insights, with uh, many great things. I have yet to read it. It's on the list. It does need to be read. A shotgun blast does not knock the shooter down. bullet would not knock down the recipient. Yes, exactly. So, next on my list of topics is faster than light travel. And this is the great thing about sci-fi. We can imagine anything we want. Do our, does our current understanding of physics allow us to travel faster than light? No, we can't even approach the speed of light. Or approach it in any meaningful way. So, this is where we get to have fun. We get to be creative with our physics. So, the, there's a lots of examples of other people, uh, of, of universes out there that have done faster than light travel. Wait, you don't have to brace yourself to fire a shotgun? Well, you can try to fire without bracing it. It'll suck. Somebody do a YouTube video of it. Anyway. So, things like Star Trek. All of the physics in Star Trek are mostly wrong. But they did have advisors come up with these techie-sounding words to make most of it uh, 
at least sound plausible. But at the at the core of Star Trek, they held true to uh, a nugget of truth, and that a matter antimatter reaction contained in an energy field could be used as a power source. Things like Mass Effect. Show of hands. Who here has played any games in the Mass Effect series? Or read any of the books? We have one. We have one. The rest of you sadden and disappoint me, and you all need to find an Xbox and play Mass Effect. I'm telling you, it's worth it. Even if you never play the actual game and just read all of the apocryphal data that's inside it, they have these huge text files that explain all of the really cool physics that goes on. Or, or do what I do and watch someone else play it. Yeah, or watch somebody else play it. Well, you don't even need to play the game. Just boot it up and read the, the info in the, in, the, uh, in the encyclopedia. It's a really cool read. It's really well worth it. Um, they go into massive details explaining how their faster-than-light system works and how uh, objects moving at near the speed of light would have a red shift or a blue shift in the, in the visible light spectrum depending on whether you were looking ahead or behind them. Really, really worth reading. Really neat, plausible physics. The series of stories, The Crypt, by Scott Sigler, and their stealth space submarine, the PUV James Keeling. Wow, so cool. Whichever physicist he had helping him with that, top notch. He describes this stealth system in space being based on heat that the entire ship is cryogenically cooled before it leaves off on a mission so that it's as cold as the background in space because they paint the thing black so you can't see it visually. So the only other uh, system that you can use to detect it would be uh, some sort of thermal vision. So as the, the sub is as cool as the surrounding space, it's invisible. The longer it stays out in space, the more it warms up. So the whole crew at the beginning of their mission is wearing these cryo suits to keep them warm. They stay in stasis for the, as long as possible to uh, keep the, the, the uh, ambient heat inside the, the ship as, 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 as low as possible. And as it warms up, they lose their stealth abilities. And once they reach a critical temperature, they have to turn around because it's like a subsurfacing. Everyone sees them because now they've, they start to glow thermally. Really neat physics. A nugget of truth. We're still talking about spaceships flying through space faster than light and blowing up space aliens. Impossible. But they, they clung to this nugget of truth. And that's, that's what I'm saying. The, the whole point to my presentation here is that to know the rules, to break the rules, you have to know the rules. So whatever universe you've developed, whatever universe anyone develops, write down your rules. Come up with your universe and your system and stick to it. Inconsistencies will kill a story faster than anything else. And eagle-eyed readers will be very, very quick to uh, tell you you've made mistakes like I did when I misidentified one of Superman's powers in a, in a previous post as to how the new movie made Newton their enemy. Yeah, don't do that. Uh, people know Superman, and they will very quickly uh, let you know the mistakes that you've made. Sorry about that to anyone listening, but hey, it got sorted out in the end. It was still a fun read. It was still a great fun read and still a lot of, a lot of sense. Also, don't make up XX and XY as Sigler did. Yeah. I haven't read about that mistake, but uh, yeah, yeah, that would be a pretty big thing to mix up. It's 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 in nocturnal. Mm. It's genetics. Rory wanted to point out. Yes, Rory. That he died in the crypt. Yes, Rory in died in the crypt, and so did I. Talking about. No, no, you didn't. No, I didn't. I did. I should have died. Yes. Rory died. No, oh, it's okay, Rory. We still love you. All right, so. That ends the, the formal part of my presentation. All right, now we're over with that. So I will now ask everyone to unmute their mics if they so wish and uh, throw in any, qu any questions, comments, queries, complaints, death threats, etc. If you're something. Yeah. Anyone with a show of hands? Anyone have anything? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? Come on, I'm 20 minutes in, people. Yes, you do. Sound in space. Sound in space, none. There is yeah. no sound because sound needs a medium to travel through, and space is an awful medium to conduct sound waves. It doesn't work. The only sci-fi universe I've seen to get this right is Serenity, in that space in all of their scenes is quiet. And uh, 2001, I think. But, but is it forgivable? 
like in Star Trek? Can you forgive it? I I can if it's done well. Um, it's poetic license. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, Babylon Five did have sound in space because you do hear the blasters shooting on the on the stations on the station guns. And that cool noise when um, the the ships decloak in Babylon Five. The yeah, don't the shadow ships mm -hmm. make a noise when they when they when they when they phase in? You guys can talk now. You don't have to type it. Yeah, yeah. You guys can talk, right? It is a forgivable mistake um, because, especially in a visual medium like television, you do need sound. And. Uh, for television, for movies, yeah, I, I, I can forgive it. Now, if somebody chooses to hold to that nugget of truth and that there is no sound in space and they do do it well, I think it, it would add an element of immersion. This is more of a thing of adding elements and not taking anything away. If I may? Yes. I would not forgive it if they used sound in space as a plot point, for instance, um, well, we heard the ship moving and oh, yeah. that's how we oh, okay. Were. Yes. Yeah, can you hear that spaceship coming? I can hear it. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, I watched uh, the the Curiosity movie from mm -hmm. the NASA, and there's sound in space all the time. Mm. I didn't get it from NASA. I didn't get it. Mm, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the sound from uh, from them being in space or through the landing where they come through the atmosphere? Oh, uh, from the beginning, their sound in space. Is it the yeah. dramatic sound though? Uh, it, it does a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every that. little move and pop, and it does a sound effect going with it. Yeah. Actually, on that question, on, on Curiosity and traveling through, was there an atmosphere inside Curiosity or was it vacuum inside? In other words, if there was a microphone sitting inside of Curiosity while it was traveling to Mars, would there have been sound of the thing rattling or the engine shaking or would there have been a vacuum inside so there should be no sound? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure on the design of the probe. Um, if, it, if it was pressurized and it did have an atmosphere inside, uh, then yeah, a microphone would have picked up all kinds of really neat ambient noises. Um, the whole album, maybe. Yeah, well, months and months and months and months. You know, tune in for track 784 of, <laughs> as Curiosity travels to Mars. Tune in next week for more of the same rattling squeaks. <laughs> you can, you can find on YouTube these fantastic videos uh, or audio recordings that that NASA did years ago. Uh, using radio telescopes pointed at planets to pick up the ambient radio noise that the planets generate, and then adjusting their frequencies to the to our uh, spectrum, and then releasing them. The sound of Saturn and Jupiter are almost like music. It's it's wow. really cool ambient trippy noise. Uh, speaking of space, I think one of the most disappointing things will be if we ever go out into space, it won't be nearly as pretty as all the pictures. No. And even with uh, with Curiosity on Mars, um, NASA has mentioned on every photo that they have been retouched to bring up the light levels to what it would be on Earth because Mars uh, gets a lot less light than the Earth because it's further away. So Mars happens to be a lot darker. Trying to find an unretouched photo of how dark Mars actually is, I can't find one. If anyone finds one, please link one to me. Uh, throw, throw one to me on Twitter. I, I, I'd really like to find these unretouched photos because I need them for research for uh, another project. One thing that's also interesting is a lot of shows like Star Trek, they also have faster than light uh, communications, so you don't have the seven minute delay between someone saying something and then getting the response. And even in all of the engineering manuals of Star Trek, whenever somebody asks, okay, how do you communicate, excuse me, faster than light, they always respond with, oh, it's subspace. And they just leave it at that. Yeah, it's subspace. And then they, they never try to explain it any further, just subspace communications. Oh, okay, I get it. And I love how on Star Trek, sometimes they can talk in real time, and sometimes they can't. They have to send messages. 
and generally, I think it's uh, whether or not they've run out of plutonium or not. Oh yeah, yeah. The the physics in Star Trek are very much generated by the plot, the writer, and how much he was paid that day. I think. <laughs> yeah. And whether or not he was going to be back next season. Yeah. Hello, the cutest of Borg. Now, how much do you think that's allowed to be done? I mean, uh, the book that I wrote, uh, I kind of went, okay, I need these things to be, be true in order for me to kind of set up the universe visually and, and the elements I really wanted. Uh, so I do have a form of fast and light travel, essentially, as a, a if you will, a, a, a wormhole, you know, which is one of those acceptable theories. Uh, portably generated wormhole, so, you know, I cheat a lot there, especially for power. <laughs> Uh, communication is done through relays and there's no massive amount of data communication so you can't do visual communication but you can still send text files around so you print it out at your destination but at the same time I'm thinking of this as kind of a uh, you know a steampunk inspired Victorian setting so you, you get this weird combination how much do you think of that as acceptable and is it mostly about being consistent uh, and would you and would you write out all these things I mean I'm, I'm a I'm a pantser. I write as I go. I'm not necessarily worried about setting up the story bible of, of physics before I start. Well, the, and that that just that happens to be the way that the, that I write and think about things. You know, the the whole engineering background is I have to set my rules and I have to set my guidelines, and then I'll have my sheet. And I do, I do this in almost anything. You know, even when I'm I'm creating a spreadsheet for something at work, I will write up a, a list of notes for myself of things that I have to make sure to remember not to forget. Um, if you're a seat of the pants type guy, no, I, 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 I think you got it quite right. Is that it's consistency that what can, that that is what counts. Um, inconsistencies will kill your story. If, uh, as you said, you know they didn't have data transmission and they couldn't do video, but then suddenly they did, with no explanation, it would sort of pose questions in the reader's mind. And if there was enough inconsistencies, it might take the readers out of the story. Um, whatever ground rules you've set for your universe. Those are your ground rules. Those are the, the you know that's your setting. Play within your setting, and be creative, be imaginative. Sure, just no. You, you were a hundred percent right. It, it's consistency that counts. Um, if I may, I think that in most sci-fi settings dealing with space travel, you have to come up with faster than light travel uh, just to get us out there. And so you kind of have to break those rules there. I'm also wondering, too, if it's not crucial to the plot, how much do you care? I'm reminded of the story of, and I forget the, the scientist's name, he's a prominent guy right now, uh, but he wrote to James Cameron and said, look, the stars in your sky and Titanic just aren't right. And Cameron actually took this, and in the re-release of the DVD, actually changed the stars to be the right, uh, the right surface. But at the same time, wow. I'm thinking, wow, somebody's really pedantic and really needs to stop doing this. <laughs> they need their meds. Or it's their job, though, you know? Well, he's a science so, communicator, and he wants it accurate, but there's a certain point where it's like, wow, you're, you're really going too far. <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, all in moderation, of course, but it goes back to what I said before about Star Wars. Star Wars breaks absolutely every rule, but does it matter? No, because it's a fantastic story. Um, Star Trek breaks a bunch of rules all the time. Does it matter? No. Um, it's, now I'm sure that, you know, uh, of course, like anything, that they're going to get the angry fan letter that, oh, your, your dilithium crystal was purple instead of green, and I have this book that, you know, proves that you're wrong, or the stars are wrong in Titanic, that's, <laughs> that's awesome nerd rage, but, uh, <laughs> I, uh, wow, you're never going to please everybody, uh, I'm, I'm going to just ask one more question, then I'm going to shut up and let everybody else go. But uh, what, in your opinion, do you absolutely have to get right? Like, I know, I know one of the things is you are a gun geek, so like the bullet example you gave before where you shoot somebody, they don't fly back 10 feet. Is that something that you think people really do have to get right? Or is it really something that it's, if your setting is realistic, that should be realistic, but everywhere else you kind of go? I think you have to. I think you have to establish a set of core rules and and stick to them, whatever they are. Um, if you're going to write in a realistic universe, get the basic realistic physics down. Um, if you are setting some sort of high fantasy world, then yeah, have your high fantasy rules and and stick to them. It's the um, 
it's 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 the core nugget that that you base the science in science fiction on that you have to stick to. Just like uh, uh, Star Trek has always clung to the matter antimatter reaction, and no matter what other plutonium they throw at it, they stick to that matter antimatter reaction as being the fuel that fuels everything around them. Um, until red matter was introduced. Yeah, red uh, matter, and then well, look at the rage that 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 created. <laughs> because they broke one of their cardinal rules. If I may, mm. uh, a pet peeve of yours, though, is somebody cocking their gun 15 times before actually shooting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> basic, a lot of the faults that I find in the, a lot of the engineering and physics faults are not due to the director or the writer's fault. They're the editor's fault. The, the guy who is trying to tell the better story and is making concessions in reality to tell the better story. So you'll watch a guy never reload his gun for an entire movie. And the mag has... Yeah, exactly. That's continuity. Um, concessions made to reality for the point of, uh, of storytelling all comes down to the individual director and or the individual editor. And that's where he makes his money. And that's where he has to decide, what can I live with? And can I sleep well tonight knowing that... Chuck Norris never reloaded his gun in the entirety of Delta Force and that the missiles on the rack of his bike kept replacing themselves every time he'd fire them off. Can you live with that? Sure. Did it help the did it help or hinder the box office scores? No one cares, it's a Chuck Norris movie. So hey. Did that uh, come anywhere close to answering your questions? What's the most recent film or book where you were pulled completely out of it because of a physics error? Hmm. Oh, I know. Hmm. Dark Knight Rises. The explosion. Dark Knight Rises, the explosion. Remind me which explosion. At the end of the movie. Oh, yeah. Don't spoil it no. for anyone, but... Yeah. yeah, the explosion at the end of the last Batman movie. Enough said. Oh, my God, the things they got wrong in that. But, hey. Um, no, the last thing that pulled me completely out of it um, that I can talk about is the trailer for the new Superman movie that they released, where you see Superman, who in all of the literature that I've read, the tagline says, able to leap over tall buildings. Superman doesn't fly, he leaps. And in this video, you see Superman jumping into the air, and he's in the stratosphere and he accelerates past Mach 1 and you see the shock disc come off his body as he accelerates up. Someone that jumps or any object which has imparted their kinetic energy through a launcher, like let's say a gun, an arrow, or someone jumping, you have your maximum speed in all of your acceleration the instant you let you leave the ground. So Superman jumping over a building is at his fastest speed just when he leaves. But. But as far as I know, uh, in the uh, Superman cartoon of the 40s, it was cheaper to animate him flying than it was jumping. So they got rid of the jumping power, and he's flown ever since. They just <laughs> they just never changed this tagline because the other taglines didn't work as well as able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. So Superman does fly. I got that wrong, and uh, the nerd rage that ensued very politely let me know that I had gotten that wrong. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, Newton's laws. Newton. Uh, I believe that they should and could apply to magic. I mean, most people think, oh, you're writing fantasy, you're writing magic, you don't need to follow the laws of physics, but uh, the third law about uh, opposite and equal reactions, mm -hmm. uh, often you'll read somebody writing about magic and all of a sudden they can create this energy from anywhere. I much prefer and find uh, fantasy more believable when the magic has a cost. When you need to get that energy from somewhere. In any in any high fantasy setting or in a, any crazy sci-fi settings, the rules of physics can be can be used like plot points. I mean, if you're going to break all the rules and go completely crazy and have guys that generate fireballs from their fingertips, and you want to add something about okay, the the thermal shock of creating all of that heat would create like an intense field of cold or would radiate heat through the mage, then yeah, okay, add that in as a plot point. It could do nothing but help. Or it could it could hurt if you were bad at it, but you know, if you think about it and you and you work at it, it yeah, it's a plot point. It could be used. 
You can hover faster than any other hovering thing. Like, um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide. Douglas Adams. Yeah. That's the guy that wrote the, the Hitchhiker's Guide said, the, the spaceship hung in the air in the exact way that a brick doesn't. That's a great way to deal with physics. Yeah. Just be irreverent. Yeah, just be completely nuts. Now, with recent it, breakthroughs, um, like the the supposed possible uh, finding of the Higgs boson, new exotic theories are coming out, and science is always on the move, especially in the in the fringes of these things. Outer space and how space travel really will work, we don't know. We aren't doing it yet. Um, do you think that's a playground for imagination, or do you really kind of have to be cautious when jumping out into that area? Like, for example, gravity waves is the big thing that they're talking about with the Higgs boson. If gravity waves exist, maybe we can make artificial gravity, for example. Absolutely, and anything that's way out there, or uh, anything, uh, no, uh, you said it right the first time, it is a playground. It is a chance for you to grab onto a theory and just sort of play with it. I, I see it anyways. Like There was that, that time, the, the few short weeks, where we thought neutrinos moved faster than light because uh, uh, of a, a calculation error done at CERN that they had uh, some particles that were moving faster than light and suddenly physics was up on its head. Oh, it is possible to move faster than light. And it was a, a, a crazy week of reading and there was all kinds of crazy theories and things that were going out there and you can play with that. Absolutely. It is your playground. It is your chance to be inventive and creative as long as the rules that you've set and the nuggets that you hold true stay true. If in your world, uh, you know, visible light makes a sound, stick to it. Whichever. Of course, that's an interesting, that could be an interesting idea. Since we're so used to hearing light, how do we know it doesn't make a sound? Mm. All, of, all of light and sound and radio and everything is just an, an entire wide spectrum of waves. And our human senses are adapted to responding to one very minor part of that spectrum. Certain animals like cats and dogs see in a broader spectrum than we do. Um, other animals hear a broader range of the, things like bats, you know, communicate through sonar by using a, a, a higher uh, part of the spectrum that we are um, deaf to. Uh, so there's nothing out there saying that, uh, you know, an alien being or something would use d different sort of senses. Maybe they hear color. Maybe they see sound. Maybe they communicate in an entire spectrum that we don't see. Maybe an alien uh, or, or another uh, another creature has eyes that see in uh, different bands of radio. So they come to Earth and suddenly they're flooded by massive colors of everything, Wi-Fi and portable and Bluetooth and radio, just broadcasting these massive waves. You know, the guy gets close to a radio tower and he's just blinded by the brightness or deafened by the sound of the radio pulsing because... That's what his sensory organs pick up. You know, it's all there. It's all things that uh, that can be played with and, and seen. Who knows? We're blinding the aliens. How the waves are generated is important. Yes, it is, exactly. Are there any other questions? We'll go for a final question. Oh, I'm going to ask one of those summary questions again. Kind of, uh, You've mentioned a few things that really, really peeve you. Um, ignoring the ones we've already talked about because you already mentioned them, what would be your, say, top three or top five things that you see very commonly done that really, you know, disturb you in a sense? Hmm. People flying back when they get shot. People flying back when they get shot by energy weapons, like a laser beam, and sound in space. I would say would be my, my my top three. So people flying through space when being hit by an energy weapon is probably really bad. Well, a laser a, a laser is just a focused beam of light. The damage that a laser weapon would cause would be um, caused by the by, by by the focused light beam hitting you, and you know the the thermal changes. It's the same thing as using a magnifying glass on an ant. There's no kinetic energy hitting the ant. A laser beam imparts no kinetic energy onto an object, unless you're talking about like solar sails and things. 
and even then it takes a long time to accelerate an object, the laser damage would be from the thermal shock. It would burn through you. It wouldn't send you flying. And now, of course, things like particle projector cannons or uh, things that, that fire compact bursts of energy, uh, you know, Gatling mass drivers, Gauss guns, etc., those are all for a further post at another time. But, you know, strictly laser weapons, the guy's got a laser rifle, he shoots somebody else and the guy flies backwards, I got problems there. Now, beyond your own experience, uh, like you said, you don't have necessarily formal education in this, but obviously an interest in a professional education in this. Where do you go to verify these sorts of things? Or, or is there a basic, like is there a set of books you have, or is there a set of, of guides that you really go back to time and time again, and, and you know, reliable ones presumably as well? Uh, the, the books by Stephen Hawking, uh, a Briefer History of Time, I must have read back to back to back to back to back a, a couple of times just to make sure that I understood, and there's a lot of things in it that still escape me. Um, Wikipedia is always your friend, uh, although, you know, it can be trusted as far as you want, but the source is at the bottom. Um, NASA has a fantastic uh, archive of information on their site, and it's all available free. It's all open source. All of their photos and videos are open source. It can all be just troll through NASA.gov and see what you find. Uh, they actually have the data transmissions from the Voyager probe available in real time, and you can go and download the files and watch all of the data as it streams back from the, the farthest and fastest objects we've ever made. And I can't read nor decipher what the numbers mean, but I don't care. They're cool. Anyone else? Any questions? By the way, hmm. if anyone ever needs to buy presents for the Clockwork Doctor, I have learned, while he may be very hard to shop for, if you find a book that involves science, guns, physics, or airplanes. Even if it looks like a textbook, buy it for him. I love textbooks. Devour it. Textbooks are his favorite. I've got one book on my shelf now. It's called Why Does E Equal MC Squared and Why Should I Care? That was a Christmas present. Yeah, it was a Christmas present. It's a fantastic book. They start off in the most complicated math they deal with in the book is they start off by talking about the Pythagorean theorem, so triangles. So if you can remember grade 8 math, and you can wrap your head around that concept. That's as complicated as the math in the book gets. But by the end of it, they're getting into uh, Einsteinian, Einsteinian physics. Uh, not dumbed down, but just explained in a very approachable way as, it, as they proceed through the book. And uh, really sort of helps you wrap your head around some of these higher concepts. I got two minutes left on my time slot. Uh, Mr. Treed, Ms. Scott, any questions? Have you read uh, Singularity? No, I haven't. But, but oh, you got it. You'd love it. But I met the author. <laughs> He's cool. Yes, he is. Are you, you on his email list? No, uh, Ray Caswell. Okay. He was at uh, the Fred X last year when you were on training, and I went to. Uh... Oh no, you were here, but I went with uh, encapsulated one. Ah, oh, yes, very yeah. good. Very cool. Different singularity. Oh, are you talking about um, Michael Spence's singularity then? Build this no. map. Which one? <laughs> Build this map. Yeah, it's a fiction novel actually, uh, ah. set and talking about the, uh, the uh, oh the the instant. Um, Starts with a K in Russia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kudowski, Kud, Kud, I used to know the word. Uh, Kastanga, wasn't it? Kastanga, event. Where it was. Uh, uh, I'm so uh, embarrassed not to know this. They theorized it was a, a some type of comet that exploded. Uh, there were there many different theories that it was either an asteroid or a comet or something that came down and it exploded. Uh, didn't actually hit the ground. It, it exploded before it hit the ground, and although it looked like a, a crater, and it, it, all, everything around it was like a, a an atomic bomb blast. And it was the most powerful of, explosion on Earth until the advent of nuclear weapons. Um, 
And one of the theories that Bill DeSmet fictionalized was it was a singularity that hit the Earth and is now in an orbit around the center of the Earth. Ooh. It is a micro singularity. Or they call it a naked singularity. It's really nice, too, because he develops up the fiction ideas as well, so you don't know exactly what's going on, but slowly he feeds you the science of it. And there's a whole series of talks he gave after the book was put out right. about the science in this book. Right. And uh, we'll one of the list. reasons he came up with that, with that secondary uh, podcast, it was the, one of the main characters from the book did a lecture series on the science behind the book. So it was a fictionalized character doing talking about the science. And uh, he, he thoroughly researched it. Uh, uh, UT in Austin, Texas is where he got his science from, the physics department there, someone there. And so uh, he tried to be as accurate with and as possible with the physics involved. And it deals with time travel as well. Well, that does sound really, really cool. I'm going to have to look that up and add that to the list. Treat, can you send uh, me a link? It's uh, in Patio Books. Singularity and Patio Books. Yeah, I'll look it up. Yeah. Yeah, Dead Tree. That'd be great. Yeah. It's, well, it, it's in, uh, uh, I think it's on Amazon. I saw the bookstores, and I said, I want that book. And then a couple of years later, I saw it on Patio Books. And so I started listening it and started started commenting on on stuff there on his website. The about, there. Well, it'd be nice Yay, to hear the you. science behind this. And there were other people who echoed that. And so he, in conversation with people who were listening to the book, came up with the idea of doing this lecture series after the book that explained the science in singularity. Right. Well, thank you for that recommendation, and uh, thank you all for paying attention and uh, listening to me prattle on about physics for a while. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing this. I'd love to do more of this. Uh, you can find me at uh, nimlast.org slash blog, with space graciously provided to me by Nutty, uh, where I rant about physics and Mars and ballistics and why gun things annoy me. And... Uh, can also be found on Twitter at, at the underscore clock underscore doc at the clock doc. We can talk more there, of course. And uh, so please stay in touch, stay in contact. If you want more, if you want less, if you want me to shut up, if you want me to talk more, let me know. We'll talk. <laughs> more. <laughs> so I am now going to stop the official recording.